Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, particular thank you to uh, uh, the BIS uh, Innovation Group for allowing a scrappy uh, tech startup guy to, uh, to moderate this panel of, um, this very distinguished panel of people I respect a lot. Um, and, uh, and especially be able to um, uh, address uh, some of the SMB and BAS leadership. Um, so today, um, in this panel, um, we're going to talk about DeFi and stable coins. And the, um, I'm going to give a, 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 a pretty short kind of overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'll try to be as like, descriptive as possible and not <clears throat> editorialize. Um, uh, but uh, where I find that unavoidable, I'll, 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 I'll make that explicit. Um, so, the, so the first, um, the, fir the, the first, the first part I want, I, I, I want to say, just to set the stage, is um, that it's really important to think about stable coins um, uh, as a system, like we do uh, with uh, with money in uh, the existing financial system. Uh, and uh, I think this, this quote by um, Mr. Karstens, um, uh, money and payment systems together make up the monetary system and should be seen as two parts of the same whole. Um, often it's the case when jargon and vocabulary creates an object, like you know, a stable coin, um, tends to frame the discussion around um, the component rather than the role the component plays within the system. And the relationship between um, a, a stable coin and the protocols, in this case blockchain protocols, that enable its functionality, its transferability, um, capability of being controlled by smart contracts, et cetera. The, the utility that comes from stable coins is part of the, um, uh, the decentralized payment system. And for the same reason that we can't really give a good characterization of, um, of fiat currency, um, it's commercial bank money, uh, M M1, you can't really characterize that without also uh, uh, understanding how uh, fiat currency transfers from one bank account to another and the systems um, uh, that, that make that, that magic happen of Alice's bank account at HSBC gets debited and Bob's uh, bank account at uh, Citibank gets credited, all the stuff that runs behind the scenes that make that possible. Um, the payment systems part um, is part of the characterization of, uh, of fiat currency money. And the same holds with stable coins. So, um, uh, so let's start with, um, with that in mind, uh, that stable coins are, are part of um, a broader system. Uh, let's just ask, ask a question, what, what's a coin? I mean, what's, what's, what's the meaning behind that jargon? And that jargon actually has like a, quite a specific meaning that even predates Bitcoin, uh, comes from the, um, the field of financial cryptography, where it's been known for like a long time that um, you know, a chain of, of cryptographic signatures where um, you know, the payer uses his private key, his or her private key, uh, to cryptographically sign a message including the payee's public key. You can build a chain of these um, uh, cryptographic signatures and create something that um, uh, quite amazingly actually has the, 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 the key indicia of a property. It's excludable, uh, it's capable of assumption by third parties. Um, and when you include the system part, which is the, the solution to the double spending problem, uh, the, the ability to uniquely identify these chains of cryptographic signatures, um, which is what, in the case of Bitcoin, Nakamoto consensus, um, more modern blockchain pro proof of stake protocols, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, whatever the underlying technology is, there is this logically centralized like single record of that chain of cryptographic signatures and that creates digital assets. And, 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 the, and the really interesting character of digital assets, um, which makes them very different from uh, today's money and, um, and all financial assets is that they're commodity-like. They, 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 you, you note that in this, this, this definition, um, which comes from this, uh, the Bitcoin white paper, um, we define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signature. There's, there's no reference to uh, the coin has value because it's a claim on some, on some issue or, or on, on some, some third party. Um, and that is a unique form of property that it has characteristics of being like commodity-like, like precious metals, 
um, but without uh, the, the, the physical characteristics of, of, uh, of that type of, of scarcity. Um, and uh, certainly doesn't have the, the digital assets certainly don't have the, um, uh, uh, the property of being a, being a claim on, on another party. So what's a stable coin? Um, and a stable coin, there are lots of definitions have been offered of this. Um, uh, I'll just take the FSBs. Um, it's a crypto asset that aims to maintain a stable value relative to a specified asset or, uh, or pool or basket of assets. It's a good enough definition. Um, it could probably be generalized a little bit um, uh, because I think it would be fair to call us like a stable coin, a crypto asset that's stabilized relative to a, a price index, for example, not necessarily a, 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 an index of assets, but, um, but it's descriptively correct in terms of all the stable coins I'm aware of in existence today. <clears throat> So, um, so if that's what stable coins are, like let's let's talk about, um, and this is, uh, th I think this is a really important part um, of kicking off the discussion with the panel, is like what are the different types of stable coins, um, and uh, um, there are actually quite a number of different flavors of these things, um, uh, but the key distinction is between um, custodial stable coins and non-custodial stable coins. And custodial stable coins are defined um, uh, by having an issuer. Um, and in addition to the coin, the crypto asset of the coin, the coin also has like a legal right to redemption. So it's the redeemability of the coin um, that, uh, that, that provides, it's redeemability against real money um, uh, from, from the issuer. Uh, that, uh, that's its mechanism for, for, for stabilizing, uh, stabilizing its value. The other class of, uh, of, of, of stable coins are the so-called non-custodial stable coins. Some people call these algorithmic stable coins. Um, and uh, uh, algorithmic stable coins or non-custodial stable coins are um, more in line with the underlying ethos of DeFi um, in that there is no issuer. Um, there's stability just like, because stability is a function of supply and demand like anything else. Uh, demand increases, supply needs to increase, demand decreases supply needs to decrease, the mechanism for um, changing supply um, uh, is not through issuance and redemption uh, against real money uh, um, by, uh, held by an issuer, um, but through um, uh, minting and burning uh, uh, the coin versus on-chain collateral um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a particular, um, particular market-determined price. Um, so um, stable coins, um, uh, um, uh, non-custodial stable coins, are really a type of cryptocurrency. They're like they're like a, a form of cryptocurrency that doesn't have a, has a, an elastic supply rule rather than a deterministic supply rule, um, and that was that's what gives them their their um, their, their their stability. Um, so they're very different systems that have different problems and different opportunities. Um, uh, um, uh, important to keep that in mind. Um, uh, uh, in the discussion, in the discussion today, there are subdivisions within these two categories. Uh, within custodial, um, we can we can carve this up in multiple different ways, but I think the most useful way is to think about uh, where the reserve is held. Um, so we can talk about uh, custodial stable coins that hold um, uh, their um, their cash reserve uh, in commercial bank money, and there are stable coins that hold their um, cash reserve in uh, uh, in, cent in central bank money. Uh, in the non-custodial uh, category, they're really kind of two different categories of uh, non-custodial stable coins, um, uh, and they're, they're distinguished by uh, how their collateral is uh, is treated. Um, the thing that you can convert the stable coin into um, uh, um, is either collateral that's external to the protocol. Um, uh, so, in the case of uh, uh, the, the the oldest uh, stablecoin uh, um, maker die um, that was originally ether um, uh, um, it's now a basket of, of multiple uh, uh, of crypto assets but um, uh, but they're all crypto assets that are outside of the die protocol uh, external to the die protocol um, other uh, uh, the endogenous uh, variety of stablecoin um, uh, actually has the collateral as part of the protocol itself. Uh, and this is like a crypto asset that um, uh, typically has a valuation um, basis to it. 
um, uh, that captures um, the, the transactional utility through fees of the underlying stable coins. So you can almost like, like think of, if we take Terra as a, the, uh, um, the, the Terra stable coin as an example, um, uh, the, the, the Luna um, is this native staking coin of the Terra blockchain, which holds UST, the Terra um, uh, uh, dollar stable coin. And, it's, uh, and that, that Luna collateral that backs um, uh, the, uh, uh, the dollar stable coin collects, uh, collects fees off of all the transactions that, that takes place um, on, the, on the Terra blockchain. Um, so just quickly, a um, uh, few statistics about size of the market. Still quite small, just under 200 billion today, market capitalization. Uh, the custodial stable coins are in blue, the non-custodial ones are in red. Um, uh, custodial stable coin market is quite a bit larger, about five times larger than the, the non-custodial one. Um, this is a space that's grown uh, a lot over the last, uh, over the last uh, two years. Um, uh, so still small, but, um, but very um, uh, aggressive growth rate. Um, just looking at the, um, uh, like the breakdown of the market capitalization um, a little bit further, um, you can see uh, the most popular, largest stablecoin um, in the market is uh, Tether, USDT. Um, it's uh, the oldest custodial stablecoin, um, plagued by lots of concerns about the quality of their, uh, their reserve, but nonetheless, um, the largest stablecoin in the market, followed by uh, Circle's uh, uh, USDC. Um, and uh, the third in line in the custodial uh, flavor of these things is, uh, is, uh, is Binance, uh, Binance's uh, uh, Binance dollar. And then um, uh, in the non-custodial variety, um, uh, there's the, um, uh, the, the largest non-custodial coin is UST, uh, um, which I just talked about, um, uh, which is a, a, an, an endogenous collateral-based um, system. Uh, followed by MakerDAI, um, which is an exogenous collateral-based system. So one of the interesting things about all these guys here in the bottom right-hand corner um, is that there are actually meaningful differences in uh, the mechanism design um, behind, uh, behind these protocols. They, they, they are uh, very meaningfully differentiated from each other. Um, and uh, that's... Um, that pretty much describes the, um, uh, the space. So now that that kind of stage is set, um, talk about the role of stable coins in DeFi. And I think it's fair to say that like, DeFi wouldn't exist without stable coins. Um, uh, um, the panel earlier today um, talked quite a bit about uh, some of the stable coin use cases. Um, uh, here we can see um, like the two most um, largest use cases being uh, decentralized uh, exchanges, uh, yeah, so um, swapping coins uh, uh, directly on, on the blockchain rather than through centralized exchanges, um, and uh, collateralized lending, um, where uh, you can lend or borrow coin against uh, posting collateral of another, another coin. Um, and uh, in both of those cases, uh, the role of stable coins uh, is, is quite clear. In the, um, Stable coins are almost always the quote asset um, in, uh, in decentralized exchanges, uh, so they're one of the assets that's, uh, that's being swapped. Um, uh, they're also the most commonly lent or borrowed asset in uh, collateralized, uh, collateralized lending protocols. Um, so um, some of the potential problems of, of, of stable coins um, I'm just going to kind of focus on the custodial ones. Um, uh, um, but we can cover some of the issues with the non-custodial ones in, in the panel discussion. But um, one, of the, one of the issues of custodial stable coins um, is that if they were to become popular, um, custodial stable coins that are hold the reserves in commercial, commercial bank money um, uh, have uh, the implication of, um, of creating deposit substitution. So this is the kind of scenario where Alice like, decides that you know, she'd rather hold her uh, US dollars you know, in, a, in USDC, in a, in a crypto wallet, rather than uh, on deposit at Citibank. Um, now, the bank deposits on aggregate don't change. Um, what happens in aggregate is that uh, the bank kind of gets disintermediated from the end user, um, and those deposits flow back to 
the banking system in the form of, uh, of wholesale, um, wholesale deposits, which are generally um, less desirable um, uh, to the banks. Uh, they're, they're less predictable in terms of, uh, of liquidity requirements. Uh, they probably have to hold more um, regulatory capital against them, so less profitable. Um, so not, not a great development for um, the business model, the business model of, of banking. Whether that's a feature or a bug depends on your perspective. Um, the, uh, uh, the next issue is like in the taxonomy I showed you earlier, uh, um, the, I kind of broke down the custodial stable coins into the ones that hold the reserve in commercial bank money and the ones that hold the reserve in uh, central bank money. Uh, the latter are sometimes referred to as uh, synthetic CBDCs. And um, there was a, was a very interesting development in this space since uh, you know last summer, um, where um, you know Circle put out this press release saying that they intend to become a full reserve national commercial bank operating under the supervision and risk management requirements of the Federal Reserve, et cetera, et cetera. We believe that full reserve banking built on digital currency technology can lead not just to a radically more efficient, but also a safer, more resilient fin financial system. Now. Um, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is an interesting development because um, not everyone agrees with that. So um, uh, the text here, uh, I, I, won't, I won't read it out, but the text here um, is uh, not related to stable coins themselves, but related to something that I want to connect uh, some dots here. So there was a, back in 2019, there was a proposed, uh, the Fed uh, um, proposed an amendment to Regulation D. Um, where they, the story behind this is that there was uh, a startup bank called the Narrow Bank, TNB. Um, the founder of the Narrow Bank was uh, an ex-Fed uh, research researcher, uh, Jamie McAndrews. And the business model of, of, of TNB was really quite simple. It's like, um, all this kind of wholesale um, uh, um, trading firms, uh, corporates, uh, uh, who want to hold uh, you know, their, their cash um, uh, in something more safe than, than bank deposit um, uh, can put it in the narrow bank. And what the narrow bank would do is hold it um, as reserves in their Fed master account. And they would just pass on most of the interest on excess reserve to, to the depositors. It's a very, very simple, simple business model, and you can see how that could be popular. Um, uh, the Fed didn't like this idea. Um, uh, uh, said they uh, refused to open an account for um, uh, a Fed master account for TNB. TNB sued the Fed. The Fed came back with this uh, proposed uh, um, uh, amendment to Regulation D, basically saying you can't do that. And what was interesting about the um, uh, the proposal is this particular text, where they refer to one of the potential implications of basically allowing narrow banking in the banking system is it can be destabilizing to the fractional reserve banking system by being too popular, um, uh, by draining li liquidity, potentially in times of stress, draining liquidity away from fractional reserve banks into, into narrow banks. And um, uh, which uh, I call this the deposit alternative problem. Um, I, I understand that from a conversation earlier today that uh, in, in central banking research, this is uh, uh, like referred to as the problem of digital runs. And I think it is, I think it is a very real problem um, or an opportunity, again, depending upon your perspective of whether you think narrow banking um, as an unintended implication of uh, popularity of stable coins, custodial stable coins, uh, um, depending on your perspective, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not, but the potential of it being an implication all the same probably needs to be kind of front and center um, the discussion, uh, in my opinion, the discussion about uh, custodial stable coins. And I'll just conclude um, with that summary um, uh, with uh, this quote from Andy Haldane, uh, former chief economist at Bank of England, uh, to show that, 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 um, uh, that not everyone's uh, 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 from the central banking world is uh, uh, un unhappy with the prospect of, you know, narrow banking-like um, uh, implications to, uh, um, to uh, stablecoin, narrow bank stablecoin uh, uh, business models. Um, and uh, um, that um, is interesting for a number of reasons, not least of which it seems to be a, a habit of um, 
central bankers who retire from the Bank of England uh, to publicly espouse the potential benefits of narrow banking. Um, but um, I think it is important to connect the dots between that potential implication, which is probably the most significant um, uh, uh, potential implications of custodial stable coins um, uh, to the stable coin topic. So um, with that, um, I'll kick off um, the interesting discussion with, uh, with, with the panel. So um, instead of um, instead of doing the botching the introductions myself, I'll let I'll let each of the panelists um, uh, spend 60 seconds. Uh, just um, tell me who you are um, and uh, and why um, you think this is a, an interesting an interesting topic. We'll start with. Uh, David Puth. Great, thank you. Thanks, Robert, for that great introduction. So my name is David Puth, and I'm the CEO of Center. Center was a company that was formed by Coinbase and Circle with the idea of developing a governance organization, both technical and other governance standards, to ultimately develop a global network of interoperable stablecoins, commencing with USDC. So USDC was the the first uh, stablecoin that operated using the center framework, and we're now in the process of working with others around the globe to do the same. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it's me. So my, my name is Alexander Berenson. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Basel. Um, I have my entire life been fascinated by, by money. Uh, already in my dissertation, I was writing papers about money. Um, I actually, in the uh, end of the 90s, um, I was also in California, there was all this discussion of private money, digital money, we had this discussion. Um, and there were actually um, protocols there, like eGold, that worked and had the chance to, to become big, but then the FBI uh, kind of closed it. Or the CIA, <laughs> I don't know anymore who. Um, and that was the thing, you know, like how can we decentralize it, you know, how can we create a private money that can't be seized? And that was basically not, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, invention. And I have to say, he made my life. I mean, since then, not, not, not as early, but, you know, from 2014 on, that's my, my dedication. Right, thank you. David Nunes. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, David Nunes, I'm the head of SDX, which is the uh, sixth digital exchange, so you, uh, the world's first fully regulated financial market infrastructure uh, with a CSD uh, and exchange based on top of blockchain and DLT technology. Um, I'm really interested in this conversation today because you know, we have we, we power our cash leg with a with what is today considered a, a stable coin or a, a custodial stable coin, as you pointed out, um, or a, a, a synthetic C CBDC where uh, where all the reserve is you know is held at the SNB. Um, but very much looking forward to this conversation. Great. Thank you, and uh, Katrina. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for organizing such a great event. My name is Ekaterina Anthony. I represent Crypto Valley Association. I'm board member. Uh, probably not everyone know, but we are quite a big organization. Our membership uh, uh, landscape is uh, more than 10,000 people in Switzerland and uh, outside Switzerland. We help to support startups and uh, educate the market on uh, crypto uh, activities and uh, developing of the industry. I also uh, chairwoman of IDAXA, it's a global organization supporting digital exchanges. And um, here I would like to also share my experience because I'm involved in compliance where I try to be bridge between a regulated world and decentralized and help them to coexist. So yeah, I'm happy to share my knowledge as well. Right, th th thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with like the first like obligatory question, um, which I want to get uh, um, the the response from each of you on, um, and that's uh, um, that's like what is what is the role of uh, stable coins in uh, in DeFi today? Let's start with you, Katrina. Okay, um, I think that it's important to have stable coins because uh, really when we talk about trust and uh, 
about security, of course, investors need to have uh, stable instruments that we can uh, trade. And uh, we just hear a lot of discussions already. We now know all that uh, two thirds of the money which are in decentralized finance actually from professional investors, right? It's not like retail uh, customers. So uh, in my uh, opinion that it's essential to have instrument where you can hedge your risk and have a, a stability mechanism. I also believe that uh, you can look at technology point of view here where you can actually back uh, your stable coins with commodities or real assets uh, in the market. And uh, But I also believe that um, we will not avoid regulations, you know, when we breach between a stable coin, which back to the uh, real assets, yes, traditional assets and decentralized world. So this is my short answer. So, no, thank you. Regulations coming. So, David. so uh, from my perspective, it's a sort of it, it's the um, the not entirely at the moment satisfactory foundation of DeFi. So it's it's required for. Uh, as Katarina mentioned, so to, to enable you to uh, to essentially get out of the volatility that, re that is represented by uh, by the cryptocurrencies you otherwise you're involved in um, when participating on DeFi protocols, uh, and it essentially acts as a payments platform uh, for, for DeFi. Uh, what is going to be interesting here is to see how how that can be improved um, in terms of. Uh, regulatory oversight and also the role of CBDCs within that particular that sort of stack of technology that supports DeFi. Interesting. Alexander. Uh, Robert, you actually said everything about it. So the only thing that I can <laughs> say here is, look, I mean, we already have stable coins, right? In the traditional financial world, that's called the US dollar. It's called the Euro Swiss francs. And just think about the, the tra traditional financial system without these assets. It, w it just wouldn't work properly. And I think it's the same thing. Now we just, this is for DeFi. Um, but I have to say something nevertheless, because Look, so why are we sitting here, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we are sitting here because something, an innovation happened that is extremely successful, right? And this innovation is not so old. Think about Ethereum, probably seven year old. DeFi is probably two year old. Congestion that we see on, on Ethereum, the high prices, is because it's so successful, right? And it can't keep up with scaling, and we, we, we Instead of bashing DeFi, and of course DeFi is very kind of young. There's a lot of things that don't work properly, there's a lot of scams, etc. But instead of bashing it, it would be more useful to actually sit down with these people that are innovating. We have two geniuses here, Michael and, and Robert. I mean, Michael, for example, set up a, an application, Curve, now has 20 billion dollars TVL. And he innovated this, I think you told me yesterday, about two years ago. He was sitting down, writing this up. And this will be one wave after the other. Every young generation has open access you know, to, to this technology. It's open source, it's open, everybody can innovate. And generation by generation, we'll do that. That thing is unstoppable, and instead of bashing it, we should you know, embrace it. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I, I, I want to. I'm going to come back to you later on, <clears throat> on on this point because I want to get your thoughts on why you think DeFi is as popular and been as successful as it is. Um, but before doing that, um, uh, David Puth, you have uh, probably more than anybody uh, sitting up here um, are closest to. The operational reality of uh, stablecoins as a business model. Um, what do you think of the state of it in DeFi today? I, well, uh, certainly that stablecoins and safe stablecoins have have created the foundational layer that has enabled DeFi to grow. And I think I would certainly agree that this is one of our generation's greatest innovations. And while stablecoins uh, relatively unexciting and on a standalone basis they've created this foundational layer to enable this technology, and it's, and it's only just begun. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's really kind of dig into this now. Like, um, uh, 
David Nunes, one of the um, uh, one of the projects I, I, I mentioned on an earlier slide um, uh, was Project Helvetica. Um, uh, um, uh, and can you tell us a bit more about um, about this uh, synthetic CBDC um, of SDX? Why it's different from uh, some of the more well-known stablecoin projects? Yeah, absolutely, very happy to do so. So. Uh, Project Helvetia was um, a, a two-phase project that was uh, driven by the Bank of International Settlements with, with, with the support of the, uh, of the Swiss National Bank and, uh, and five commercial banks and SDX operating as the third-party platform provider for the technology. Uh, we proved through Helvetia that from a, a legal and an operational um, perspective and also with integration to core banking systems that you could carry out a number of uh, of, um, of workflows uh, within these within the um, sort of delivery versus payments security sort of uh, co uh, construct um, with, with a CBDC. So at the moment today on SDX we are because there is no uh, CBDC um, that's been issued by the Swiss National Bank. We we uh, to help to, to manage the settlement of the of securities transactions. Uh, a member of SDX deposits Swiss francs with SDX. We hold that at, a, at an account at the Swiss National Bank, which is why we consider it to be a, a synthetic CBDC. But it's still underneath SDX's account. And we then issue tokenized Swiss francs, which then sit on the ledger uh, to enable the atomic settlement of those transactions. And Helvetia was uh, enabled us to go one step further in a controlled set of experiments to prove out that we could do the same thing with a CBDC. So we've ta so taking that whole process one step forwards in, in terms of how you would actually then implement a CBDC within that within that particular construct. And given that we're a financial market infrastructure provider and the Bank of International Settlements sort of, uh, um, advice around how FMIs uh, perform the cash leg, uh, ca settling that in, in central bank money is obviously is the most sort of risk-free uh, way of carrying about that. So the, the, that is the uh, the um, the recommended uh, mechanism. But in the absence of a CBDC, that cannot be done in this atomic settlement construct today. Uh, so it would be really interesting for us, and I'm very enthusiastic uh, to see how uh, the SMB uh, proceeds with their policy decisions around uh, a CBDC uh, to actually move to that final stage of essentially completely eliminating settlement risk uh, in the securities transaction by instead of having still the, the, the counterparty risk of SDX being uh, the holder of the, uh, of the account, actually having the, those accounts held at the SMB and the cash load being settled in central bank money, to, money because at that point, combined with atomic settlement, you now have no settlement risk whatsoever, uh, which I think would be a, you know, a, that's an utter game changer for the financial markets and in the capital market space. And, and, and what is it that makes, uh, that makes that project a stable coin as opposed to another uh, um, delivery versus payment uh, FMI integration? So why would a CBDC be considered not a stable coin? Yeah. I think because ultimately it's, it's a risk-free asset. Uh, so it, it ultimately backed by the central bank, it's that, it's that sort of fundamental foundation uh, that you don't get today with commercial bank money or, 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 with, or with any of the stable coins that exist, even in the case of the sort of synthetic CBDC that we have, there's still theoretical counterparty risk associated with the fact that your counterparty is, uh, is SDX. And, and do you, um, uh, shift this question to the other David, um, uh, like, do you see that, um, uh, that distinction between uh, custodial stable coins that are backed by central bank money versus uh, custodial stable coins that hold the reserve in commercial banks? Like, do you see that as a, um, an important distinction um, uh, in terms of the evolution of this space? And in, in particular, um, for uh, you know, for for Circle, um, the the published intentions for Circle to be uh, like a narrow bank business model. Do you think that entails uh, like a change in the composition of its uh, reserves at some point in mm -hmm. the future? Well, certainly we would all see the distinction between central bank money and commercial bank money. So there's there's there is a fundamental safety difference there. So I agree wholeheartedly with David about about that distinction. At the same time, the uh, the bulk of the world operates on commercial bank money and, and I think does so quite safely. Uh, whether circles move into a narrow bank actually enables further growth of stable coins, I can't really comment. I think it's an interesting proposition for them to make. But 
what I, what I think the, the greatest interest lies today, and the question that comes up most often is, is how do central bank, how does a CBDC and, and a stable coin exist in the same ecosystem? And my answer to that, I think, is the one that you're probably trying to get at here, which is you've got stable coins, even at approaching 200 billion today, it's, it's still a very small amount of money in the overall ecosystem. However, stable coins are able to perform today exactly what a, a central bank digital currency will be able to do tomorrow. I, I think we're still a very long way off from having a practical retail application for central bank digital currencies. The prospect for what can happen with stable coins today in terms of enabling financial access to the literally billions of people in the world that, that do not have banking access today it will take so long for a central bank currency, it's a digital currency to get there. Let's try to employ stable coins today to make that difference. Uh, the ability to move money at the speed of the internet for virtually no cost in today's environment is real. It's an opportunity today that we have and we're starting to explore much further. So I think that I, I appreciate the distinction of central bank money and commercial bank money, but we have an opportunity today to literally change the world in terms of in terms of financial access, and I need, I believe truly that we just need to continue to invest in that and create financial access for those that don't have it. And right. so keep keep moving forward. Um, um, and Katrina, you mentioned at the beginning that um, you know, regulation is coming. Um, so. Can you tell us what you think the impact of uh, regulation is going to have on the DeFi industry as a whole, but also in particular, like what it means for uh, the existing stablecoin projects? Yes, I think that uh, in general, uh, the whole evolution of the crypto industry and including stablecoin is uh, in, a, in a way. So we see the global adoption start happening. We can't stop it, of course, anymore. Uh, but we we're still far away uh, from, you know, understanding how the decentralized finance should co uh, coexist with the traditional. And we have to let's say we have a three words now. We have a traditional finance, which are uh, pretty stable, the same at the moment. We have uh, something in between, like a, a, a custodian, a, a crypto uh, regulated environment, like uh, let's say Coinbase or Kraken, which already purely regulated, they exist pr uh, practically by the same rules like a traditional world. And we have this uh, DeFi, where we have also peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So the question is that if we have peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized world, and we have traditional world, and we have already something in between with these exchanges who are trying to deal with both, uh, we still need to see how we can you know, transfer from one world to another, right? And here we uh, have a lot of issues. If we look at just stable coin, uh, First of all, it's a cross-border. You know, we don't have uh, the same regulation uh, where we still need to issue stable coins. Not, uh, you know, if we talk about centralized uh, stable coins, we still need to uh, develop them here in the traditional world, back to the traditional currencies. And then uh, the definition of stable coins are also differ very different from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, so we don't have a common approach. Then uh, if we would like to create something in Switzerland, for example, it will not probably possible to transfer it without any risk to other countries. And uh, uh, Financial Action Task Force, they uh, pr produce a lot of recommendations where they uh, really stated that if you create a, a stable coin, Today, you need to make sure that you have power of the uh, control over the IML. So if you issue that uh, stable coin, then later you need to guarantee that it's go, not go to the platforms where you, uh, you know, in some countries where you don't have control anymore, you don't know what happened with the stable coin. So this is a big issue. This is sunrise issue, we call it. And it's not only for stable coins in the whole industry, and we also can talk about travel rules here, like uh, SWIFT for crypto, yes, if we talked about traditional world. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the uh, you know, main uh, 
problems to uh, to create uh, the uh, stable coins. Also, if we look at the um, issuing mechanism, you also will probably end up with a lot of regulation and uh, licensing because uh, we talk about different type of stable coins, but they also uh, can be collective investment. They can be, uh, you know, something where you need to have a security uh, prospectus. So. This is, uh, this is a lot of uh, questions uh, still not answered. That's why we don't see booming of stable coins, we, and especially in jurisdictions which are more regulated than in others. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, because like the, these have, by almost any KPI, <laughs> been a hugely successful business model over the last two years. You know, like why haven't more stable coin issuers, custodial stable coin issuers been set up? Um, and, and your view is it's because of the impending changes in regulation that may make that business model less uh, less attractive. Yes, I think that if we look at the requirements which uh, uh, now are in place uh, from the, let's say, Financial Action Task Force, I would say it's rather easy to issue already centralized bank stable coin to be used uh, in the, uh, in you know, in this ecosystem, because then at least uh, central bank can control it, you know, because this, uh, or you need to really have a solution which will uh, have a blockchain uh, that will be compatible with many different factors, you know, from technical point of view, you need to control everything what will be in secondary market and guarantee that it's secure and it's not, um, you know, in, in, it's in line with uh, IML law mm -hmm. as well. Well, I, th I think uh, I would step out on a limb here, but I think probably everybody uh, on the stage here, um, you know, would agree that some level of regulation is needed for custodial stablecoins. Um, uh, a question for Alexander: Like, do you think, um, do you think that uh, non-custodial stablecoins also need to fall inside some regulatory perimeter, or should uh, they be treated <clears throat> differently? No, I think uh, it's exactly this this type of stablecoins which. They cannot be regulated. I mean, if you think about liquidity, this is just a small contract. It's living by its own. There is no address. You cannot even write a letter mm. as a regulator there. And I think this is a good thing. That's my hope. Because I think the current regulatory environment worldwide is so inefficient. I mean, it's so costly to do kind of cross-border uh, uh, finance that I really think the only way around that is that one of these stable coins you know, no, uh, non-custodial stable coins is going to be so big at some day that you can't ignore it and then you have to adjust worldwide common sense regulatory framework. Um, DM, why has DM Libra, why, have, why do, did they fail? Because they wanted to be regulatory compliant. It's impossible. And I think the, or, or it's very costly, of course it's possible. You know, but it's amazingly costly. Um, and I think this is so, just so inefficient that we need to you know, get uh, some solution around this. So just to follow up on that, um, uh, I personally don't disagree with the answer at all, but, um, uh, but, but one of the um, potential challenges of it is that um, almost all of these uh, stable coins, non-custodial st stable coins as well, are, are, are dollar pegged. So they're pegged to um, a, an existing unit of account. And what do you tell a central banker um, uh, who says, okay, there's this future state where this yet to be identified non-custodial stable coin becomes hugely successful, that I have to start including it in my monetary aggregates, you know, because it's, it's, it's pegged to the dollar or the Swiss franc or uh, some other fiat currency. What do you tell a central banker that um, that future state of affairs is not really a problem even though some unregulated form of your fiat currency um, uh, is now arguably like something that you should care about because it's in your backyard? Well, that, I think first of all that takes a while, you know, I mean, uh, um, but we can imagine this. I think at some point, when it comes to non-custodial stable coin, I mean, there are two types, you know, fully collateralized, like DAI, uh, or liquidity, 
and kind of non-collateralized algorithmic stablecoin. And there I have my reservations. I think that's very dangerous. But stablecoins like DAI, you know, that are fully collateralized, they, they, you have very little systemic risks from them because they, they are co collateralized up to 150%. Of course, it's, it, there can be always, you know, some really dramatic event, say, on the at the price, and then it depacks. But the probability is very, very low. That's why I think they are even safer than, you know, you know bank money. <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in traditional banking, we, we, we have these bank failures from time to time. You know, that's also a depeg, right? They, they issue liabilities which, which are pegged to the dollar or are pegged to the Swiss franc, and then they just fail. And they say, well, I can't pay you. That's a deep peg. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic about stable coins, non-custodial stable coins that are fully collateralized. The other ones, we talked about this, like Terra. I have a little yeah. bit of uh, my doubts. Not a, yeah, not a fan. Um, it's an important distinction, though, um, for, for sure. I, um, David Puth. Um, on the topic of regulation, going back to uh, uh, the custodial stablecoin um, domain, like, so the regulation is definitely coming. Uh, I mean, it already exists depending on the jurisdiction you're in, uh, exists in some form, uh, um, uh, but that regulation is gonna change. Uh, it's, it's on the way. What, what, like, what would you say to, um, to a regulator in terms of what their immediate focus on uh, Stable coins should yeah. be. So USDC today operates in a regulated environment using state money transmission laws that perhaps were not immediately designed to help solve that. If I were sitting in the global regulator seat, I would focus initially on operational resiliency, the strength of a public chain, what can it do under a variety of different stress test scenarios. I would look at the claim on money and make sure that that claim is, is uh, one that is secure. Uh, I would look at the quality of reserves, which is something I think we do. Part of what Center is in business to do is to provide standards to ensure that, that uh, among other things, there's reserve transparency. So I think that that's already being accomplished today. And then lastly, uh, the, the whole topic of settlement finality, which in retail transactions, I don't think makes a tremendous amount of difference. Settlement finality takes, atomic transactions take place on small transactions, but if we were to get to institutional sized transactions, trying to solve this question of settlement finality uh, is one that's, that's really critical to the development of stable coins going forward. But the first focus should be on operational resiliency. We've now got billions and billions of dollars in the system operating on public chains in, I think, a very secure way and, and I think a very resilient way, but that's gonna need to continue to be the focus of the regulatory community. As on the on the finality like settlement finality topic like you have this like this concept of finality in the blockchain world which is like technical you know about when when the state of the blockchain uh, becomes irreversible um, and and some blockchains reach finality very quickly others are probabilistic and never never get there um, like um, but then you have the concept of settlement finality the legal concept of settlement finality that we know in in in, in the legacy world. And I mentioned in the in the introduction, you know, that one of the key like distinguishing factors between the custodial stablecoins and the non-custodial ones is that the custodial stablecoins are a crypto asset, but they've also got this like contractual right to redemption that's attached to it. And like, do you see any particular like potential issues um, with um, finality of transfer, like scenarios where um, the token transfers on the blockchain, um, but some condition, um, maybe it's bankruptcy of the of the sender, um, uh, that the legal the, the legal thing that's been stapled onto the onto the crypto asset doesn't transfer with it. Like like, do you, do you see that as a problem area that needs that needs more attention? I, I, given the 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 fact that it it's only going to happen under the most extreme stress scenarios, it's something that needs to be addressed. I don't think it should stifle the growth of stablecoins today. Uh, but getting legal finality done for stable coins and for crypto assets in general should be something that, it's a legal issue, uh, not a technical issue. Technically, we know that it's, it's able to be done today, but we should solve that legal problem. And I think more investment needs to be made in that area. David Nunes, do you, um, I, I want to get your review on this as well, because like, is, is this potentially like one of the areas where like the 
you know, maybe the distinction between the synthetic CBDCs and uh, um, the stable coins backed by commercial bank money um, uh, start to differentiate themselves beyond just the reserve, but also the, the kind of permissioning of the ledger, the rules around uh, finality of transfer, or converge? Like, like, like what, what's your, well, what's the, your view on that? It's a really interesting question, and it's certainly one that, uh, that when SDX was, uh, was initiated in 2018, one of the, <coughs> one of the concerns was uh, how do we actually achieve the finality requirements for an FMI? Uh, because the, the public chain uh, technology available then, and even to a great extent today, would not allow for that. It didn't, it didn't actually achieve the legal definition of finality from the perspective of financial market infrastructure, which is one of the reasons, uh, and there are several, that uh, the implementation of SDX is on R3's Corda uh, private ledger um, uh, technology, because we could achieve finality uh, through that particular technology. So I expect that in the future there will be innovation that enables us to uh, to, to leverage public chain technology more effectively for that. But um, it was something which was very much front and center when it came to our uh, design around how do we actually build a, 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 the CSD specifically on the blockchain technology to, to address that, 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 that concern. Um, and again, for it to be a completely uh, risk-free settlement process, then ultimately that has to also have the, uh, the, the central bank money as the backing for that, that cash leg. So it's yeah. like one tiny step away at the moment from that being the case. Okay. I say tiny. It's a significant policy decision by the SMB. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Um, uh, so I, mean, I, I think this is interesting. So like I, I think um, my oversimplified view of uh, the regulatory landscape is I, I, I tend to like see this the, the financial regulation that's all about consumer protection, kind of you know. Um, uh, protecting the retail person. And then there's the systemic risk uh, stuff that's targeted at um, uh, um, large financial institutions. And, um, uh, but in DeFi, we seem to see like the, 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 the distinctions between them are starting to blur because you, you're getting types of like trading activities um, uh, that are taking place in DeFi um, that if they became even larger than they are today and given like growth rates the last two years, if you extrapolate from that, they certainly could. Um, uh, you know, start to become the kind of systemically risky kind of kind kind of thing, and um, uh, I, I'm interested um, to focus first of all just on the, on the more kind of retail facing side of this. Um, uh, um, uh, um, Katrina, like your views on the um, uh, AML um, uh, AML KYC, the travel rule. Um, uh, how are we? going to reconcile um, the s seemingly requirements around um, uh, uh, um, uh, custodial wallets um, uh, with what's probably one of the big driving forces of uh, like success behind DeFi is but precisely the absence of that of that kind of gating how are we going to how are we going to reconcile those uh, those 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 two those two forces I think that uh, first of all, of course, and we discuss it a lot today, uh, the, uh, not all projects are truly DeFi. This is we need to accept that there are really DeFi projects and uh, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of cases when you start to analyze uh, the project, when you come to the conclusion actually it has centralized mechanism somewhere. Yeah, it can be, and uh, it was really discussed quite in details what uh, what can it be. It can be that uh, IT, uh, you know, uh, team as in developers influence it, or there is a marketing activity, and so on. Uh, so if we uh, just extract this really decentralized um, world, that I would say at the moment uh, we, you know, from regulatory point of view, I would not worry too much uh, because it's, if it's really decentralized, it should exist as it is. But uh, everything what is related to the um, intermediary touch need to be comply with the regulation. So if uh, the project is, has a uh, you know, centralized uh, governance, then uh, we need to see how it can address the IML and KYC, how they can control uh, what type of funds uh, coming, to whom they go, and so on. And here, of course, as I already said, um, it's pro I think that for regulator, it's important 
you know, I can't say push, but I would, I wish that we have uh, like a, a swift uh, for crypto in this centralized regulated world because it will really simplify uh, cross-border transactions. Today, uh, there are not many countries who really adopted, but uh, the good news, uh, we just on a DAX level, on crypto level, we analyzed the existing uh, solutions were enough already uh, done uh, by developers in different countries. We have OpenVAS protocol, which merged with TRP, for example, in Switzerland. So travel rules can already be implemented, but uh, it should be like maybe deadline from regulatory point of view that until this moment, uh, you have to comply with this. But what I'm saying, not for DeFi, yes? <laughs> I don't want to make um, like uh, some uh, restrictions for DeFi, but it's, it will be important that globally we have adoption and uh, industry need a bit of push because each country, neighbor looks at another neighbor, company at another, and it's like a chicken egg situation. Nobody moving at the moment. So I would say uh, this will really uh, speed up the process of adoption and uh, regulation. Yeah, regulation will evolve, but again, uh, the same principles, uh, and very often we have inefficiency in regulation. In traditional market, we have a lot of problems. It will not, inf uh, you know, the DeFi uh, cannot be regulated, but we need to find the way to interact between each other, like zero knowledge proof and other things, uh, where the when people move funds from DeFi, and we saw that there are a lot of transactions now, but maybe these transactions happen because people, they don't know how to get out with this money from this environment. They can't justify, they want to, you know, get out from the profit, they don't have, uh, uh, they don't have resources how they can cash them to the real fiat because it's difficult to explain, and uh, not many banks will accept it, maybe several in the world, right? Uh, so, so, and just to have this bridge, uh, again, we need to see how to do it, and uh, I know there are already solutions uh, which capable. I know your company, uh, uh, David, is uh, working on such solution uh, where we can uh, help this coexist. Because again, uh, my vision, uh, we will not have only DeFi for, you know, in, in two, three years, maybe in 10 years, it will be all more a la DeFi format, but it will be a very long transition period where uh, the technology needs to be evolved and a lot of investment should to be done. Should be done, yeah. So I think I, 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 I agree with that. I think it is, uh, it is going to take time. And I, I think to, to kind of take, listen to, to make it really, really concrete, like one of the things that is that surprised a lot of people was the degree of um, also kind of regulatory forbearance around uh, um, custodial stablecoins um, in uh, in KYC AML. So, like uh, you, you can today, um, there's no there's no permissioning around USDC. So, um, you know, I I could someone could send me USDC even though I don't have a relationship with Circle. And uh, um, and arguably, you could take a, like a literal reading of you know the FATF recommendations and and say that shouldn't be allowed. That uh, you should have to whitelist you know um, everyone who's uh, you can't send you know USDC to an account unless uh, uh, they've been onboarded through through uh, through by by circle by first onboarded by circle. So um, I, I'm 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 interested to get the perspective really of anybody on the panel, but I'm directing it. Um, at at, at uh, David David Puth, um, like like what what's like what are the pragmatic solutions um, to keeping the liberality of uh, of of stablecoins whilst like complying with the purpose of uh, of uh, the AML KYC um, uh, uh, regulations without uh, killing the golden goose. I, th I think it's creating decentralized identity solutions uh, is is absolutely the way that needs to go. And we, we know that creating uh, a better identity solution than that which exists today is, is going to be good for the world. So having uh, better situations whereby the holder of, uh, that we all get to hold our own identity and just share that information which is most necessary for that particular transaction, that to me is gonna open up an entire world of solving some of these issues with respect to both stable coins, but other crypto assets. So um, 
decentralized identity, I think, is the, is the answer and the next step. Yeah, I, I would agree completely with that. Do you want to go first, Alexander? Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. OK. Oh, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is a non-custodial wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I have some Swiss francs in it. Now, I would like to pay Morton, you know, because he paid me my beer. <laughs> now, the travel rule applied to non-custodial wallet would, would require that we report <laughs> that transaction, and that's just crazy. It's totally crazy, but it's in fact right now the Euro European Parliament has, is in discussion of doing this. And there was a kind of a subcommission that actually said yes, even transactions between non custodial wallets need to be reported. And that's, that's completely crazy. So, what's the optimal solution in my view? It's the same as with cash. I don't have to do report if I pay Morton, but if I bring more than 10,000 francs, or in Switzerland, I think it's 100,000, I don't know anymore, to the bank in cash, they have to ask me a question. If I go to the bank and I say, OK, give me half a million in cash, they have to ask me a question. Right? That's the correct thing. You have to, you have to control the entry points. But once you are in the system, you, you don't want this traveler rule to be applied to every transaction. And I think this is the, we have to just regulate it in the same way as we regulate cash. And that's a sensible regulation somehow you, because at some point everybody needs to get, you know, you cannot just live in, in metaverse, right? At some point you have to pay, I don't know, your beer and, 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 and your rent. And uh, so we get in and out of the virtual kind of blockchain world. And at that point, that's where you can control. And I think that's where you have to apply AML and KYC. But we do want to be paying for beer and rent with stable coins before yes, too long. But I don't so want to report that. No. <laughs> right? If I, <laughs> well, I, I would disagree with Alexander on a couple of points. One, if my 11 year old would be more than happy to spend his entire life in the metaverse. He, he would. Uh, he okay. would. Yes. It, it's a, we had to actually do an intervention recently, <laughs> uh, given, given how much time he was spending playing Fortnite. But, the, um, but uh, also, on the, uh, there is something that I think we need to be you know, cognizant of around, around, uh, around stable coins, digital money, and so on, which is um, versus cash, which is the concept of smurfing, right? Is that you can do, you can much more easily facilitate lots of small transactions that are going to get under the radar, uh, versus how much more difficult that is to do with cash. It's just less practical. But my, but I don't disagree that we should that we should simply be imposing um, the regulation, the AML, KYC concepts that come from the traditional world straight onto, uh, onto DeFi. I think that would be a way of absolutely killing it. Um, and it's not appropriate given, as David mentioned, that there are out there potential DeFi solutions to these problems. So I think the important thing for, for regulators to do is, is actually have a really good think about what the future might look like, what the future problems might be that we need to be, that we need to be solving, and then solving them with, way, with innovative solutions rather than simply imposing, as we tend to do in the financial services sector, of just squeezing anything new into an old model, mm -hmm. because that's, just, that's, that's not a very sensible way of approaching things. Um, so I, I do think that we can probably ha you know, have our cake and eat it from that perspective. Uh, I'd also say that um, I think regulation is a good thing. And if I look at the, wor the world that we've got ourselves into, the, the, the sort of challenges around um, surveillance capitalism um, with sort of Web 2.0 and, uh, and, the, and the sort of the fact that the internet emerged into a regulatory white space and now it's, being, it's proving to be very difficult to kind of get the toothpaste back in the tube when it comes to our personal data. And I think that journey is going to be quite a long one. I think it does, it does absolutely, um, it, you know, we, we, this is a responsibility of regulators to have a real think about what the future implications of the technology should be and how to make sure that they balance not destroying the innovation, but also trying to identify what future problems might er er sort of evolve as a result of the innovation. But uh, so I think um, uh, 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 and this, and this is kind of going back to Alexander's point, uh, um, which you're partly disagreeing with, you know, which is like, well, um, we could just do what we do with cash. And not everybody's happy with like the state of cash, um, uh, like it's used for money laundering and uh, a lot of other things that. Yeah, I heard it. if it was invented today, or if it was you know, proposed today, invented, it wouldn't be yeah. accepted by the regulator. Yeah, so um, you know, so like a lot of people are unhappy with uh, with cash, but at the same time, um, uh, like 
it's been a highly resilient form of medium of exchange for, for centuries, um, almost since the beginning of civilization, um, uh, notes and coins. And, uh, uh, and the degree of anonymity that it provides um, is something that, uh, you know, the blockchain space has tried to um, replicate as best possible um, unsuccessfully so far, but it's tried to replicate that characteristic of cash as much as possible. Um, I mean, is there a case for um, conserving the, because we basically have two kind of states of affairs. There's the one where we say, well, our, 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 our bar should really just be as good as cash in terms of compliance. Um, there's the other that view, um, which um, I hear you articulating, which is, well, we should actually raise the bar. Like, like cash isn't that great. You know, like, like we could actually, uh, you know, improve surveillance without undermining, you know, you know, privacy using new technologies, DID, et cetera. Um, like, would you raise the bar in effectiveness, but not raise the bar in terms of onerousness? Yeah, raise the yeah. bar in terms of, uh, of effectiveness. Like, is there, um, uh, is there a, though a case for keeping um, the privacy characteristics of, uh, of cash, like aiming towards that? Or, um, uh, or is this just too good of an opportunity to, um, to achieve another like policy objective, you know, which is to you know, improve the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the effectiveness of uh, AML KYC? Well, I don't know how um, representative of the sort of uh, communities that would benefit from the anonymity that, this, that, the, the, that the audience here represents. And I'm not saying that because we're not a bunch of criminals. Um, that's not the community that I'm thinking of. I mean, there, there, there's, there, are, there are regimes out there that are not pleasant um, or where there, are, uh, where, where there are very different approaches towards sort of social issues. So if you look at sort of countries w which have um, kind of hard, hard uh, sort of uh, hard right perspectives towards religion and, and we're trying to get, uh, and there, is, there are people there who, who are working to sort of to deal with human rights abuses, but if, that inform if the information about, well, to actually get funding to them is a, is a highly effective me mechanism to actually ensure that those individuals are not uh, jeopardized in terms of their identity by, uh, by not being able to provide this, uh, this way of anonymizing the transaction or the, the delivery of cash. Uh, and there are various work, there are, and there are sex workers and so on. There are communities that, that again, could benefit from this um, when the environment that they're working in would be dangerous if, if they couldn't actually leverage this to actually uh, en enable them to continue to live a, to live a safe existence. Interesting. So, um, slightly related, slightly different question, Katrina. Like, like if you um, taking this KYC AML and uh, um, privacy and compliance um, uh, topic again. Like, if, um, if there were like two alternatives, there was a completely unregulated coin um, uh, that offered a high degree of uh, um, privacy and anonymity. Um, and one that was uh, uh, um, compliant with, in the low burden way, you know, through using new technologies like decentralized um, identity. Like, which do you think would be more likely to um, to flourish and, and, and gain network effect and, and adoption? Mm, definitely no regulated, uh, but again, uh, we talk about decentralized world and uh, regulated world. It depends who are your investors and what are the you know what what's behind this coin, right? If you if you want to uh, invest uh, like in Bitcoin, you can do it in a regulated environment now, right? You can go to Signum Bank or uh, Coinbase and buy it, and it will be custody. You don't need to think about it. If you go to decentralized world, I think it's also special. Um, mindset of people who are there, you know, who are the pioneers of this. Re they're really different and they're trying to change the perception of the finance because they want to, they don't want to be controlled. And this is where we need to find a way how to give the freedom, but also that there is no any, uh, that you have security, you know, for, for the money that you use. Because it, it, it's, uh, money means a lot, you know, it's not only uh, value uh, uh, to, to today, it's the future of your, uh, you know, family, children, uh, you need to secure yourself. So, um, but again, uh, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, world can 
I, I, from compliance point of view, I have no problems with uh, this peer-to-peer -peer transactions when, and I think cash will disappear anyway, you know, you still have to pay with uh, your digital uh, <laughs> franc in the future. I don't think in five years we have any paper money anymore. So, but if you if you do it in uh, this small microtransactions or something, you don't need to be compliant because it's uh, something, you know, if something really happen, then uh, you need to have, uh, like, uh, you know, if you if it's a criminal case, somebody should have access to this uh, uh, coins and to identify what's really happened. And then these blockchain analytics guys can help. Then you can actually, for regulator, uh, having this type of blockchain coins, maybe it's the best you can have because you can trace it, everything, what's happening. And from compliance point of view, it's uh, give you more information than cash, which is uh, in the pocket now. We don't know where it's come from. So I would say uh, I will be very optimistic about living peer-to-peer -peer environment not regulated, but as soon as you want to go into regulated environment, you have to comply, you have to explain where it's come from. So the, 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 the chain analytics and the like data analysis piece is a really interesting one that you brought up. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, do you th is that an alternative to uh, compliance uh, and, and permissioning? Uh, by just uh, like improving the capabilities, the surveillance capabilities, data analysis capabilities of law enforcement and regulators. Um, because you do have this, the, the characteristic of blockchain, it's all public, um, pseudonymous um, uh, based, based system. Law enforcement's been pretty successful, uh, as mentioned in an earlier panel today, of recovery um, in, in a number of cases. It, like, could that be a credible alternative to um, uh, um, permissioning, regulatory mandated permissioning. That's it kind of just a, uh, depends on how far it goes because it, you, know, you, you give people uh, more and more sophisticated tools, where does that stop? Uh, there is a digital currency in the world today that's used as a means of surveillance. We certainly don't want to see a world where that happens. And so I, I think technology has enabled things to happen that we maybe didn't believe were possible only a few years ago, I think regulation will do a better job of guiding things than necessarily giving, giving these super tools to people who may, they may fall into the wrong hands. And that, that, I think that would undermine the future of the potential of what we have today. Got it. Um, and, and, and on the, the, the prior question about um, you know, the, two, the choice between the two coins. We kind of have this today with Tether and USDC, right? Um, and uh, and the, the gap between the two has, um, uh, has narrowed, but, um, but uh, Tether is still um, the, the, most, the most popular stable coin. Um, like, do you think that that reflects, does that just reflect the uh, incumbency first mover advantage? Or do you think that reflects uh, a preference amongst the user base of stable coins for uh, less regulated, less compliant uh, stable coin issuers. I'll answer that quickly. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's both. I think uh, there's no question that that people appreciate the trans transparency that comes with USDC, and there's no question that people choose Tether because of the absence thereof. And so I think it's, and I think frankly that defines the world that we're gonna to continue to evolve into and that it's not gonna be one solution. It's gonna be an algorithmic solution. It's gonna be a custodial solution. And the combination of those two is going, will enable things to happen with digital money moving in a way that we never dreamed possible. So I think, I think they're gonna coexist and I don't think one model will end up there may be a dominant model in the long run, but there won't be only one model. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I actually agree with that. I think um, I think it does reflect both. Um, okay, just uh, I mean, we've only got a couple minutes left, and uh, um, I want to get. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a, an annoying question of everybody uh, on the panel. Um, uh, annoying because because uh, it's it's a, it's about sticking your neck out and predicting the future. Fast forward five years from now, um, uh, there's a quantitative and a qualitative part to the question. The quantitative part is, uh, I, I gave like two stats um, uh, earlier um, about the market capitalization of custodial versus uh, non-custodial uh, stable coins. Like, what do you think in five year time the market capitalization of stable coins as a, as a whole will be? 
And the split between these two, um, which is custodial stable coins, about five times the size of non-custodial stable coins, uh, like, do you think that's going to um, increase or decrease? So that's the, the, the quantitative part of the prediction of the, of the question. The qualitative was just um, like, what does, uh, what does DeFi and what do stable coins like look like uh, in terms of use cases and characteristics um, uh, in, in five years' time, starting with uh, Katrina? Okay, let's say now we have uh, 150 billions and um, um, difficult to say. It's, you know, it, it will be very fast growth and uh, it will be trillions for sure. <laughs> But uh, I can't predict. Uh, it also depends on the regulatory environment, right? Uh, which way we will go. If tomorrow it will be not officially allowed, then it will be gray market, which will be grow again. But then it's, you know, it will be interesting development. So I guess um, it will coexist. I believe we will have central bank uh, stable coins. We will have non-custodian and custodian coexist exist together depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the regulation, because we never will get global regulation anyway. So in different parts of the world, we will see different things happening. And let's say over a trillion, <laughs> my prediction. Over a trillion. Okay. Yes. David Nunes. I, I would agree that over a trillion. I'm very optimistic that there will be, that, that, that sensible regulation will actually be implemented, despite sort of the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth coming from the crypto native space. And I think that will actually uh, help increase adoption amongst the institutional space when it comes to DeFi protocols and so on. And, uh, and I think that the transparency uh, and the requirements around, uh, around custodial stable coins will actually increase their adoption as well. So very positive about the expectation that that part of the marketplace uh, will, be, will, will mature and that maturity will then increase adoption. Uh, on, uh, and on the flip side, I think also that um, what will also help will be uh, there will be CBDCs issued during that, within that time period, and that will, I think, act as the ultimate backstop, the sort of a, a de-risking of the whole DeFi ecosystem, which again will, I think, help, ad help with adoption overall. So definitely more than a trillion um, of, uh, of, of value locked up, as, it, as they say, uh, within stable coins within that, that time period. Okay, Alexander. So uh, market capitalization right now of uh, crypto, I think is uh, two trillion. I, I expect in five years, perhaps 10 trillion. And right now the um, stablecoin part is about 10% and it sounds about right. So that's probably 10% in of 10 trillion. <laughs> that would be one trillion. <laughs> one trillion. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> you're the professional, <laughs> and you're the expert when it comes to the economics, so I'm very happy about that. So we have over a trillion, yeah. over a trillion, about a trillion. <laughs> oh, certainly, <laughs> certainly measured in trillions, but I think where the change is going to come and what we'll see in the next five years is a mass adoption at the retail and consumer level, and that's going to enable the next real leg of growth, that crypto will continue to grow in its current state, but the enablement of payments, of cross-border payments for a much greater percentage of the world, that's where stable coins will, will be five plus years from now. No, okay. inve no investment advice. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, informational uh, only. And uh, with, we have with, to with disclaim, those. yes. <laughs> And for those uh, final words, um, uh, thank you all for um, a great panel discussion and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.